spread China, a nation that I think will more headlines in the next generation than Russia did during the last. It was a memorable experience to me to be the first American correspondent inside Red China, to see firsthand this awakening giant of the Orient. Why did I go to China? Well, let's take a look. China is a tremendous country geographically, as you can see. Rich in natural resources, cool, iron ore all over the country, water power. And when it comes to people, China is the biggest. One out of every four persons on earth is Chinese. What I saw was a revolution so profound and far-reaching that it inevitably will leave its mark on China, on the other nations of Asia, and on the rest of the world. And that includes us. For in today's air age, what happens in China is vitally important to us in America. I entered China after a long trip across Russia and Siberia and down into Peking where I traveled all over the country. I had traveled extensively in China 20 years ago and since then I've logged 70 countries around the world as a foreign correspondent. But none of these experiences prepared me for the changes in China. Of course, a big country like China does not change overnight. So much that I saw was traditional. The rice paddies, the walking masses of people crowding the roads, traffic jams of camels and goats. The familiar Chinese wall was built in the third century BC to protect China from invaders. Today, it reminds both Chinese and foreigners that whatever changes the communist regime may impose, tradition will long remain. In these temples and palaces of the Forbidden City lived the autocratic emperors who ruled China for hundreds of years from Peking. These emperors of old China were swept away in the revolution of 1911, led by the father of modern China, Sun Yat-sen. His tomb is still a shrine. But for most of the people, this first revolution meant little. 85% of the Chinese are farmers, and the life of the peasant stayed much the same. He tilled his tiny plot of land, trying to eke out a living for his family. For centuries, the Chinese peasant has fought a running battle with famine. He carefully saved all manure and carried it out and spread it on his land. At harvest time, peasant families, like these villagers harvesting millet, often joined in cooperative efforts. But in the past, this collective work has been purely voluntary. And the tools they use are more ancient than the Bible. They grind the precious grain into flour using millstones powered by oxen. This map gives some clues to China's great problem of being able to feed its 500 million people. As you can see, much of China is mountain, desert, infertile soil. The great river valleys are often subject to disastrous floods. And the population is growing at the rate of several millions a year. Nearly 30,000 new mouths must be fed daily. This is the critical problem of China. Too many people for too little land. Today, China is in the throes of far-reaching revolution. The communist rulers in Peking have organized China, as it has never been organized in its long history, by force and persuasion. The peasants have been organized into collective farms 
and then consolidated into super communist units called communes. Every commune has its militia and is organized along military lines. In these communes, the traditional Chinese family unit has been broken up. Brigades of students and peasants work together under the watchful eye of the party boss. Goals and quotas are assigned from Peking. And to meet these goals, the peasants pull the wooden plows by hand when they don't have a donkey or a cow. You rarely see one person in the field, for private ownership of land is now forbidden. They work long hours to produce enough food to feed the Chinese people, enough food to wipe out famine that has plagued them for centuries. Ask the individual peasant whether he likes the commune, and he will not criticize it, for it is treason to doubt the doctrine that the Communist Party knows best. My impression is that the Chinese definitely are making agricultural progress, are raising more food. Here, for example, is the bountiful corn crop harvested on one commune that I visited. Corn for human consumption. Some communes specialize in growing crops like cotton for industrial use. The Chinese are going all out in experimentation. Here, for example, they're digging the soil three feet deep, hoping for a better yield. Every commune has an experimental plot. They told me that this rice plot would yield a fantastic 11,000 bushels per acre. Well, that's more than 100 times a typical rice yield in China today. Rice chutes were crowded very close together. They used wind machines and overhead lights and 100 pairs of hands to separate the heads so that air and sunlight could get down into the heavy mass of chutes. Collectives are also using chemicals for crop improvement. In these and other ways, traditions are overturned and scientific methods introduced. Irrigation by mechanical means is not new, but it is spreading from commune to commune. And now the government claims 55% of all cropland is irrigated. All life in the commune is regimented along military lines. The ringing bell calls you to work, calls you to eat in the canteen, calls the women to their washing, the workers to the field. The children, they're kept in the central nursery while their parents work. The children are taught to love their communist leaders. These children are singing a song of praise about the child leap forward. To the visitor, they look happy and earned for, even though they sometimes do not see their parents for a week at a time. Their mothers, for the first time, they are not slaves to their men. But like their men, they are now subject to the all-powerful state. After work, there is indoctrination in the principles of communism. Parades and volunteer workers from the city march to collective farms or to factories where they are needed most. Shock brigades go out from the schools to help with the harvest because the communists believe everyone must learn to work with their hands as well as their heads. Parades are a powerful weapon of the new regime. This truck pulled 31 loaded trailers through the streets of Peking, a symbol of Red China's ambition to achieve industrial supremacy. In exhibition halls like this one in Peking are displayed the technical wonders which are a dream of tomorrow for the Chinese peasant. 
These irrigation pumps mean more water to produce more food. Gas turbines stand for electricity and light. This self-propelled grain combine is as modern as any in the West. This combine, incidentally the only one that I saw in China, and this tractor symbolize the goal of communist China to become an industrial power. The steam tractor and this mechanized rice transplanter invented by a peasant stir the Chinese with pride, for they were made with Chinese hands in China. The Chinese remember when all heavy machinery had to be imported from abroad. To make machines, China needs iron and steel. In 1943, China made only one million tons of steel. China's announced goal is 20 million tons of steel. The Chinese say they've doubled steel production in the steel mill the Japanese built in Manchuria. To the Chinese, as well as to the other Asiatic nations, steel is a symbol of industrial might. Typical of the new drive for steel production is this vast new steel plant in Hankow, in central China. The steel plant will be modern but it is being laboriously built by the muscles of 50,000 workers. They tamp the earth. They move the dirt in baskets. A hundred men working 100 hours may produce only as much as one machine, but there are millions of workers in China and few machines. This drive for iron and steel production is evident in the most remote village in China. I saw thousands of tiny backyard furnaces where farmers were turning out pig iron. The crude furnaces were built of stone and mud. The coal is crushed with stone implements powered by the foot. Limestone is crushed with little hammers. Iron ore is hammered into tiny pieces by hand. No tool is too simple, no effort too great to prepare the raw materials needed for pig iron. And out flows the molten iron, industrial sinews to help build China's industrial might. I saw these furnaces all over China, but the pig iron they turned out was less important than the psychological lift the campaign gave the people. For the Chinese peasant could say to himself, we are making steel, just like the Americans and British. We are helping build the new China. Having served its psychological purpose, the great campaign for little steel has since been discontinued. While steel is given much attention, other industries are also encouraged. For example, copper products for the growing electrical industry. Heavy copper wire is produced in this modern factory that I saw in Mukden. But these spinning wheels on which women are winding copper wire are more typical of Chinese industry today. Village industries, not new in China, are being organized on a gigantic scale as China tries to raise herself by her own bootstraps. Production quotas are prominently displayed on bulletin boards in factories and on the collective farms. The red flag is a symbol of excellence this is an automobile factory. Private ownership of automobiles is forbidden in China, but being able to manufacture cars is a great triumph for a nation that has long had to depend on the outside world for industrial products. To the Chinese, their infant auto industry is a matter of national pride. But there are few cars outside the big cities.
transportation in China is carried on by muscles, human and animal. Everywhere you see bicycles, pedicabs, and horse carts. Fuel is very scarce in China. So buses, using attachments like this one, burn wood and coal. To reduce her dependence on Russia for oil, China is developing a chemical industry that extracts oil from coal. This woman chemist checks a sample in the modern coal cracking plant in Fushun. Here is another parade this time against the four pests, flies, mosquitoes, rats, and sparrows. There is an extensive public health campaign in China today. This is a tuberculosis sanitarium that I visited in Manchuria, where deserving factory workers may come for a free cure. Every factory, every farm I visited had medical clinics like this, where they dispensed free medicine. It's almost a sin to get sick in China today. So every morning at 10 a.m., the factory workers go through a daily routine of calisthenics as music blares from the loudspeakers. They're very sports-minded, too, and have thousands of outdoor basketball courts. This is Peking University, one of the oldest in China. Like all dictatorships, the communists lay great stress on youth. Propaganda plays an important role. Posters extol the virtues of the new China. Posters ridicule foreign imperialists. Hatred of Western domination is very strong. This is one reason for the Hate America campaign that I saw all over China. This poster on this small steel mill says, Liberate Formosa, our national territory. Bulletin boards and political cartoons are also used as a whip to spur the people on to greater effort. But the regime provides a people with a unifying purpose. It gets a lot of people into the act. It gives them a sense of participation and a promise of the future. Whether it is a parade against imperialists or an ambitious construction project like this bridge across the Yangtze River, it is this common purpose that is new to the Chinese. The army, too, is employed on massive government projects. These Red Army soldiers are helping build a big dam. And here is a new factory building in Tencent. Peasants who never have seen the city find themselves building sewers in Peking, seeing and hearing new things. When they return home, they carry the message of the Chinese Revolution into their villages. At present, China's great friend is Russia. This big building is Russia's monument to Chinese friendship. And this monument to fallen war heroes celebrates China's long struggle against outside oppressors. These are the two forces that mold China's policy. I left Red China by the misty road that crosses the barbed wire frontier into Hong Kong. This great British-held port on the southern coast is the only doorway between China and the West. As I looked across Hong Kong Harbor, I pondered what I had seen in Red China and what it means to us. The things I will never forget are the work of the people, organized for a purpose people toiling under grueling hardship, and all in a relentless mobilization of human strength to build a new world, a communist world built by persuasion and coercion. But there's no denying that the Chinese are making progress. 
By our measures, perhaps not much. By theirs, a great deal. They are making steel, autos, tractors. They're building new apartments, bridges, hospitals. There is more food. The China today is different and be like the old China. Tradition is being flouted by the communist dictatorship. No one knows where this will lead, but I believe it has vast significance for the rest of the world. And I am sure we will hear much more of China in the years ahead.